Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burrus. I'm Grant Babcock. And I'm Jason Kuznicki. Today we're doing part two of our discussion of Murray Rothbard's 1982 book, The Ethics of Liberty. Today we'll be discussing chapters 6 through 13. Before we begin, there was a, a critique that came up on one of our Facebook pages a while back um, about criticizing the arguments made by people like Rothbard or Rand. Um, the, the argument goes that these people, these are key foundational texts um, that you should approach them as works of libertarianism but not works that should be held to the same argumentative standards of say academic philosophy and that you're somehow misfiring. There's something wrong with saying like Rothbard's arguments don't work for reasons X, Y, and Z, that that's, that's unfair. And I thought it would be good to start with this question of criticizing, in this case, Rothbard, because I think it's something we're going to do a fair amount over this episode. I think all of us were rather underwhelmed by the quality of the argumentation in this book. Um, and so I'll start by asking you guys, I guess, is there a value in libertarians who are – I mean in many cases very inclined to agree with Rothbard's conclusions about the proper role of the state um, or the lack of the state's role in any way? Is there something valuable in criticizing him? Um, are, we, are we going wrong in attacking someone as central to the movement as he is? Like what's, what's the point in critiquing him philosophically? I think the, a good analogy here is – I mean it, it is valuable to critique him. It's intellectually honest but it kind of reminds me of um, horror movies. So horror movies have had a, a huge evolution over the years and if you watch old horror movies, you're like, this is pretty bad. And I have some friends who are very big horror fans and if you, and if you start criticizing something like John Carpenter's Halloween, you're like, this is a really silly kind of movie actually at the end of the day. They're going to be like, well, you don't understand the place of Halloween in the pantheon of horror movies and how important it was at the time when it came out and how much it developed other horror movies into the future. And you say, okay, I agree but I can still criticize it. So I think you need to have both. You need to respect its place in terms of sort of jump-starting things and there are things that wouldn't exist if this did not exist but then also criticize it for, for – through modern sensibilities and modern thinking. Yeah, I think uh, the older I get, the more I become a skeptic and one of the things that I am skeptical about is how people actually do philosophy and uh, it might even be said that a lot of philosophy, maybe all of it is done backwards, that philosophers in fact begin with conclusions that they want to reach. And then they try to find justifications for those conclusions. It's not that they begin with axioms that everyone accepts and then transform them and find themselves surprised at the end of the exercise. They begin with conclusions and then try to put foundations under them. And to the extent that I think Rothbard is doing that, which I, I think he is, uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. What we can do since a lot of us share his conclusions is to uh, to take those justifications that we find useful and and uh, build on them and uh, fix the other ones that aren't so good or or reject some of them and and find better ones and uh, in that sense we're all engaged in a a common intellectual project even if uh, even if uh, we will be sometimes critical of of the things that he has to say. Yeah, I think uh, the end of what you said there, Jason, is, is right exactly on the nose. It's that. Like Rothbard isn't like a sacred text which is the end of the research program and libertarianism is over and we just need to read this and apply it and then we're done. It's a it's a living, evolving, growing, improving uh, philosophical tradition and part of improving uh, the arguments for liberty means looking at some from the past that you know maybe were important but maybe could could have been better. Uh, I also want to say in terms of you know, is it fair to apply the standards of like rigorous academic philosophy to Rothbard? Um, I, I guess maybe there is a case for that in other books but I think in the case of Ethics of Liberty, like this is his attempt at a rigorous philosophical you know, treatise to justify uh, anarcho-capitalism. So. so take it as, it, as he gives yeah. it. Yeah. OK. So I guess we'll get started. Um, so we're doing, as I said, chapters six through thirteen, which is the the beginning, the first half of part two of the book today. 
uh, the the first episode that we did on Rothbard was on part one, and in part one, he it was his setting out of the basic system of natural rights that he saw himself operating as part of. It was it was providing the grounding for the the theory that he was then going to explore through the rest of the book. And so, in a sense, if you if you missed part one, you should go back and listen to part one. But if you don't feel like doing that right now, it's probably okay because he begins part two by basically restating the summary version of what he did in part one um, to the extent that it almost feels like this is the real beginning of the book mm -hmm. um, and the other stuff was written later in order to fill in some of the missing details. But so we'll start in chapter six, which is called a Caruso Social Philosophy. So the idea here is he's going to construct a system of ethics by starting on the small scale. So we're used to this in economics, like economics textbooks start with, you know, there's the one guy, Robinson Crusoe, on the island and he needs to have stuff to survive. So he starts building and then he makes trade-offs and then one other guy enters and now we've got trade and you can see how the system works on the small scale before you add the complexity. Um, and that's exactly what Rothbard sets out to do for ethics. He says, the abstraction of analyzing a few persons interacting on an island enables a clear perception of the basic truths of interpersonal relations, truths which remain obscure if we insist on looking first at the contemporary world only whole and of a piece. Is that fair? I mean it, to – it's interesting to start off with political philosophy as just basic ethical conundrums of one person on an island and then add another person and then maybe just person by person you get up to a country or something like that. But it's it's odd because people aren't actually created that way. It's it's weird because if you contrasted this very straightforward right space, like what's right for, what's right for one person to do or wrong person wrong for one person to do is wrong when you make a bunch of people. You contrast it to Hayek, who kind of looks at this. And society was never building it up person by person. That's not exactly the first sort of premise of trying to figure out how to how to do things correctly. Um, I don't know. Is this the valid way of doing political philosophy? I, I think it's potentially a valid way. Uh, what's what's going on here is not that he's in fact trying to construct a society. Society. What he's trying to do is to isolate individual action and look at it uh, because he is a methodological individualist and he believes that uh, when you have an individual, you're looking at the necessary building block of any possible society. Yeah, that and I think also that there are, there are certain things that are best illustrated almost by their absence, right? Like to understand like what problem it is that we're trying to solve with like a contract system with talking about trade and all that. We need to imagine like what 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 it would be like to not have that and then we can see like why we would want it. That said though, there are problems here. Uh, there are problems because certain actions that would be uh, in fact suicidal in a, a Robinson Crusoe situation are beneficial in an extended society. So if I were Robinson Crusoe and I decided that the first thing I wanted to do was set up a shoe factory, that would be nuts. Uh, I would not survive. I would die. It would be immoral by Rothbard standards. But setting up a shoe factory in a, a wider society is actually at least a, a harmless thing to do might actually turn out to be a good business idea. Trevor Yeah, I think this is where he, he goes wrong in an interesting way and so we'll get to – to get to that critique, we should walk through how he gets to that problem. Um, and so he says like, OK, in economics we do this so we're going to try to do this in ethics but then what's interesting is he starts – he basically tells us the same story you get in economics and so there's this slide from justifying economic exchange to a system of ethics and the way that this works is he says, look, you know, so Robinson Crusoe, he just stands alone on the island. He's going to die. He's got certain needs and he doesn't have any knowledge. Um, he doesn't have the recipes for food and shelter and whatever else. So he has to use his mind to go out and start changing the environment around him. And so he starts building these things and we get, we get economic production. We get capital accumulation um, and then – Somehow we get an ethic of the good from that. Of some sort, which apparently is pursuing life as far as I can tell, which it, um, I mean to the point that uh, you can't hurt yourself. One of the weirdest parts. I mean, I mean but is, is this what you guys got out of it that the ethic of the good is synonymous with pursuing life? 
and that's, and that's I, it. I think so more or less and, and what's difficult about this section is that economics in the Austrian tradition is supposed to be a value-free science mm. and he's making a very strange transition from uh, value-free observation of economic activity to inferences about the good. He even says that someone who has a high time preference is acting uh, in an evil manner. Trevor Immorally. In a, in a, immorally. Yeah. And uh, that's not immoral. That's just having a high time preference. It's like having a, a higher preference for money or a higher preference for savings or, or for uh, clothing or, or food or whatever. That's not necessarily – uh, immoral or, or at least it is not the job of an economist to tell us that. Or punching yourself in the face. You might have a big preference for that. Yeah, because if we think about property rights, normally we think we think you know I have the right to destroy whatever this thing is that I have. I could you know I'm holding this this book. I could shred it up, and none of you three could restrain me or or stop me or or pass moral judgment on me. Well, I could pass moral well. judgment. On you, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you could be wrong. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it seems that like you know the the idea of self ownership, you know ownership over over your body is really important for Rothbard. But he seems to rule out you know for example uh, suicide, right? Not just suicide, like eating a burger. As far yeah. I mean, like <laughs> yeah, he's very clear. He says so. I'll, I'll read this quote. Um, Smoking. So he's cigarette. talking about like let's say Caruso comes upon some mushrooms that are poisonous, and. He, so Are you on, saying Caruso or Crusoe? Crusoe. OK. Because every time you say Caruso, I'm thinking picture of David Caruso. From, uh, <laughs> that's fine from, if you would like to okay, do that. That's what, I, that's what I'm running that in my head right now. And not uh, Enrico? Yeah, exactly. I mean. But so, so he's come along this and he says, had he eaten the mushrooms without learning of their poisonous effects, then his decision would have been incorrect, a possibly tragic error based on the fact that man is scarcely automatically determined to make correct decisions at all times. Hence the, the his lack of omniscience and his liability – to error. If Crusoe, on the other hand, had known the po of the poison and eaten the mushrooms anyway, perhaps for kicks or from some other high time preference, then his decision would have been objectively immoral, an act deliberately set against his life and health. So we get this, this like he's – we need to apply our reason in order to survive. So therefore, the application of our reason in order to survive is the standard of value. Um, and and he, so he's very clear. He's like, look, anything that prolongs life is what's good or at least anything that would shorten life as per eating the mushrooms even if you know they're poisonous is objectively immoral. But – and this, this is a theme throughout Rothbard is you want to reply it's perhaps a bit more complex than that, Murray, um, that he doesn't seem to address all of the – totally obvious examples of all sorts of perfectly reasonable decisions we make that do not have the effect of prolonging our life and often have the effect of shortening it like potentially having the burger or smoking cigarettes or, or just crossing the street at times leaving your house now uh, a, a better standard might very well be something like the life that is proper to man and and to uh, revert to a more explicitly aristotelian uh, approach to to ethics. I mean that that's uh, closer to what Ayn Rand does, and well, I, I think, I think that's a bit a bit more defensible than prolongation of life per se. Well, this is his Rand influence, I think. Yes, know, because he was very influenced by Rand, I think, and then kicked out kind of by, by her. Yeah, he wouldn't divorce his Catholic wife. Ah, that's of course yeah. so Trans he, transgression he, he, number nine hundred thirty seven right. on and her he, list. He, yes. was, he was tried in absentia and declared a heretic. And uh, okay, you know, yeah. <laughs> no one expects the Randian Inquisition. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so you see, I mean, this is very Randy, which is interest. Randy, which is interesting, as Jason said, uh, the value free element of Austrian. We're just going to get a bunch of things to see how they work together best, kind of yeah, the, idea. But then he has it. But he's writing an ethics book, and uh, right. so he has to have something in there that's. Yeah, there are several weird things about this. The, the first is it seems consequentialist, right? I, I mean, I don't, it doesn't seem consequentialist. It is, it is consequentialist. Yes. And if you ask people, is Murray Rothbard a consequentialist? They'll say no. He's a, he he's does the paradigmatic deontological libertarian. Right, but then but yeah, but then when he's trying to get his system off the ground, he he first appeals to the consequences of actions, you know, in terms of their effect on your life. Uh, and then, and then he seems to want to make this move 
um, that says like, look, you know, you you even if you say you don't believe this, you know, really, really you do, and I can tell because of how how you act. Right. This is where he gives yeah. he gives a very short version of argumentation ethics. Yeah. Uh, Yes. So uh, I'll, 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 bottom I should, of page uh, thirty-two, yeah. top of thirty-three. You cannot yeah. argue against me that life is the highest value unless you have killed yourself, and you haven't killed yourself. <laughs> right, so right. therefore, you cannot argue against me. Right. Like if you genuinely don't think life is the only thing to aim at, then you would have committed suicide rather than having this conversation, which seems, I mean, is obviously not true. Like I could, I could think there are lots of things that are more important than prolonging my life, like happiness or good character or whatever else that wouldn't then lead me to say, well, then I should kill my like, – Well, just, I might find that my heroin habit was a lot more valuable to me than pro prolonging my life, but it just hasn't killed me yet. You know, I mean I could have a – Right. You know, in fact, killing yourself heroin would limit your heroin yeah. habit. That's also true. Um, yeah. This, this seems like – there seems to be an immediate and obvious counterexample here. That was never considered. Yeah, not like, like other philosophers where you have to think for a while. You you think for about three seconds and you can come up with a counterexample. Right. Like it makes me – it actually – I mean to be honest, it makes me wonder whether the manuscript was read by people who disagreed with it At before all. publication. Yeah. Because there are so many instances like this one where someone goes, wait, wait a second. No, there's the heroin example or there's countless other examples. Like you may still be right but you need to address them. And I've, I've talked to quite a few professional philosophers about the argumentation ethic both here and in Hoppe and, and it just does not fly with them, not at all. And I, I think I, I have to agree. Uh, the worst we can say about someone who is arguing against life as the highest value is that they're a hypocrite. That's the worst we can say about them. Well, not just... even necessarily that they are, but that's the worst possible. It's not that their argument is false. It's just that they're not acting according to their stated principles, which doesn't prove the truth or falsehood of the principles. Or if you are like a very big environmentalist Gaia hypothesis, human beings should die, including me. But before I die, I'm going to devote my life to convincing other people to kill themselves first. That's the better use of my time than me just killing myself. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can think of how you can get out of this uh, w w without having to fall into his quote unquote trap uh, of proving him to be correct the whole time. Um, so what do we think about the – so we, we, were, we were talking about this in terms of acquiring property in this Crusoe or Caruso uh, <laughs> situation <laughs> where you're acquiring property. Um, and so he gets very close. He gets into the first acquisition of property, uh, which is very Lockean. Um, any problems that you found with the acquisition of property? Jason, you're looking at. You're like, well, I have no course. problem with the acquisition of property. I do. I do think, though, that uh, choosing the Crusoe example or the Crusoe scenario as a way of justifying it uh, is not necessarily the clearest way, because a lot of the good effects of private property are most obvious not in a, uh, a community of one, but in a community of millions, where where private property allows comparative advantage and specialization and gains from trade to work really, really well. And you don't see that on uh, a desert island with uh, one or two inhabitants or or at best you see very little of it compared to uh, an extended society. Yeah. Well, that's only a problem if he actually wants to make an instrumental justification for property, which I don't think he does. Except yeah. insofar as it's about prolonging life. Yeah, <laughs> except for that. <laughs> well, for yes, that. and I would yeah. probably live a lot longer and and have a much better life in a society of millions of people than I would living alone on an island. The weirdness to me about the property is is I mean he one of the thing about Rothbard that I, and I like about him is that he he bites all bullets um, and if you're going to say that you acquire property by working it. By mixing your labor with the land, I mean he basically says that. Uh, it is always interesting because there was always this question when I first read Locke when I think I was like 16 or something like that. It's like so you mix your labor with the land. So you like reach down and I don't know, dig a hole. Like you, you only own that hole, right? I mean like that does not transfer into a parcel of like, well, now you own the, the divvied out parcel of this hectare. Right. There's a, there's, a bound, there's a boundary problem. Yeah. But like yeah. you just say you, you, you only – if you're going to have this mixing your labor and he, he fully accepts this, that you – when you mix your labor with this one part of it, you only own that part of it that you mixed your labor with, which gets 
crazy when you start thinking about it. Well, could you give an example of uh, like how it sort of ends up getting crazy? So you don't – you wouldn't have – so you if you own a parcel of land like right now, I mean I think Rothbard would say like if, if you bought a piece of land in the Colo- hills of Colorado – um, or, or like, let's say we start colonizing Mars, and so you, you but you like, you're gonna make a, a you're gonna, you're gonna make a, you're going to put a, so a retirement home there, but you haven't done anything yet. So in his view, you don't even own it yet. I think. Yeah. Um, even so, the law might say you own it, but the law they could be wrong about this. Yeah, and he and actually also, he actually talks about this a little bit later when he talks about like the homesteading of the American West. Like he mm-hmm. thinks that the fees charged by the government for the plots were just like completely illegitimate, you know, rents. Yeah, and but, that like if you show up and you settle, then it's your land, and you know that's all there is to it. Well, so does this lead though to? An odd situation. See, the only part of land that you can actually own is that which you actually mixed your labor with or that which you improved as he tends to call it, um, where you actually have to have done something to every square centimeter of yes. land. I mean does this lead to like – so the, the hip thing in building houses now is often I'm going to build the house all the way up to the edge of the lot instead of having a yard, right? Um, and does this almost require that kind of action? Because well, I, if you don't, then you don't actually own those those corners that you haven't yes, done anything. I think to you yet? could walk around your land and like move. I don't know pine cones into circles or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, no, and, he he and, specifically disavows that actually when he's 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 talking about like you know you land on the island and he says if you like do this thing where you walk, like walk around the island and you know maybe put up posts or something. He says, then you own like the fence posts. You don't own everything inside. You own the fence yeah. posts, but you do not own the spaces in between the fence posts <laughs> where they, the fence right. is you know, suspended so, over that place, but I, you don't own it. Yeah. I don't know if he talks about it in Ethics of Liberty, but I, I know he does talk about it uh, elsewhere uh, about this boundary problem. And he says basically how you solve it is, is you have what's called a technological unit, which is you you look at the facts of the activity that you're in, you're involved in, like maybe it's uh, farming, maybe it's you know whatever it is, and then your your labor entitles you to like however much of the natural resource it takes to do the thing, right? So which you're going to tell me that's a non-answer? And yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Now you're nodding already. <laughs> I mean, like the funny thing is, is like is like reading this and as a lawyer. Um, and, and like kind of a real lawyer, not a fake one like Aaron. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Aaron's nodding. Uh, that and I like property law a lot. But I, but one of the really good things about property law, and, and it is an interesting question of like how how do you own a parcel and all this and like that. But is that it, you know generally prevents conflict and prevents people from trying to predate each other. But like I'm seeing Rothbard's world, and I'm seeing complete chaos where you like run onto someone's property and like you like build a little house and you're like it's mine now. I mean I mean it's like it, and that's what he has to say. So so here's a passage from pages 63, 64, and this is pretty much one edition of this book. So if you have it, it says suppose for example that Mr. Green legally owns a certain acreage of land of which the north. West portion has never been transformed from its natural state by Green or anyone else. Libertarian theory must invalidate his claim to ownership of the Northwest portion. Should another man appear who does transform the land and should Green oust him by force from the property, then Green becomes at that point a criminal aggressor against land justly owned by another. The same would be true if Green should use violence to prevent another settler from entering upon this never used land and transforming it into use. This is chaos. <laughs> yes. Is yes, it? exactly. It would be chaos. And, and we can ask a very simple question here. What would we rather have people in society doing on the whole? Would we rather have them working and improving the land and farming and mining and building factories or would we rather have them squabbling? And uh, the reason that we have private property is not because we have mixed labor with land and then we have to make sure that it always attaches to the person who has – Really, the reason I think we have private property is that it means that on the whole, we get less squabbling and we get more industry. Grant, who is I, wearing an I love Rothbard button, um, looks like he would like to respond. To yeah, that. I think you guys are totally misreading this this uh, this thing about the the uh, well. Rothbard wouldn't call him a squatter because they're not squatting. Yeah, I know. Uh, he's he's arguing against this thing governments do, where they claim 
you know, custodianship over large swaths of unsettled land and exclude other people from using it without their permission. Well, I'm not committed to endorsing that. Right. I, I, I don't but have to. I, I can just say, look, there's, there's a reason we have private property and the reason is that it on the whole has good effects on people's character. Well, and well, that's sure, got but, nothing to do with, with government but land Rothbard policy. But Rothbard gets you there. Like he's not – he's not. all he's saying is you can't just like put up a fence over some empty lot and never let anybody go there just because you don't want them to. Well, I mean I, I think you're right about him criticizing governments doing this. But we're still in Crusoe land. So we're, st we're talking about basic morality in his vision here. I think the, the issue – and this is another one of these like meta concerns I have with a lot of his arguments is that – Rothbard is extremely turned off by letting ambiguity enter into his system. Um, I mean a lot of his objections to alternatives uh, – we get to this later on when we talk about various theories of punishment is that this would – allowing this would allow a level of ambiguity into the system such that someone would have to decide, make judgment calls and if they can, then it's room for abuse, it's room for the state. Uh, it needs to be banished. So what we need is extremely cut and dry rules that we enforce through libertarian justice. But he doesn't – there are many instances where it feels like instead of addressing ambiguity, he's ignoring ambiguity. So this is one where like yes, so we can, we can set out the very clear rule that you need to actually have improved the land and improved the pieces of it that you claim to own in order to own it because you can't just build the fence posts around it. You need to have improved it. But we don't know what it means to have improved it. And if you have improved it like you've dug the hole, is that improving it? Well, if there's a dispute, someone has to decide and it's not a party to the dispute, right? Because they, they're obviously going to decide in their own favor. Um, is, is digging the hole an improvement? Maybe or it's making it worse. Um, do you own – does does that improvement include just the area that was the hole or the land underneath it or the land three inches to the left of it? Like these are questions that can't be answered by this bright line rule. What about just surveying it? Is that sufficient improvement? Uh, what if if you're not actively doing anything with the land but you the land was surveyed by the original owner, which does in fact improve it in the sense that you have adequately described its boundaries? You've Is that more useful to other people? Yeah, that, that's an interesting. I mean, I don't think Rothbard has an answer to that question. I mean, I, no. I, well, I mean, I think he would give an answer, which is no. I I, I don't know if he's right or not. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the thing to me is is uh, I mean, I have a bias in the law direction, but there's a lot of meta rules that exist in legal systems, and and this goes into the thing of like property being a social construction more than what Rothbard is trying to kind of derive from very basic premises. That we have rules because we're trying to dim diminish conflict. So he writes about adverse possession, which is in American Anglo-American laws, the ability to take possession of someone's land as long as you improve it and they don't notice it or tell you to get off of it for 21, 18 or 21 years, depending on the jurisdiction. And so, if I have a piece of land in the Colorado mountains and I'm not watching it right now, and someone has built a mill on it, and I don't go and check on it for 21 years, then uh, then I, they can actually take title of that. Now, this seems really bizarre, and so he has a whole thing about how that works. But the reason that rule exists is, is to avoid chaos of unowned and unknown pieces of land that no one knows who owned them and there are holes in the title system and holes in the title system can eventually consume the property system of an entire society. And It seems like Rothbard is not concerned with sort of meta principles about can we make a property system well functioning over many generations where people die and we have title holes and all these things like this. Well, I understand why he's not. He's not doing legal philosophy. He, in, but In later chapters, he does talk about when he's talking about what counts as theft, what counts as a criminal, he does does say like it's there. He deals with the issue of we can't figure out who the current owner is. Yes, that's true. We yes. don't have a title. Whether he does a um, satisfying job is another question. But I want to I want to stick to that's comes up in later chapters, and I'd like to try to stay as yeah. to the flow of the book as possible. So I'm going to jump now to the next part of the section, which is where he makes an argument. He he says like basically is concerned that. Um, in order for this to be a moral system that he's talking about, um, that we can morally critique people's actions based on, in this case, prolonging life or not, um, he wants to set aside the problem of determinism, of a lack of free will, because 
it's he's clearly not a compatibilist. He you know there's a he thinks it would be a problem if we don't actually have free will. But here, and so I want to throw this out here as like, am I not understanding? Because it doesn't sound like he's actually addressing the free will debate at all. So he says, I'll just read this little passage. He says, some critics have charged that this freedom, namely the freedom to apply our reason and make decisions, um, is illusory because man is bound by natural laws. Okay, so that sounds like the free will debate, right? But then he says, this, however, is a misrepresentation, one of many examples of the persistent modern confusion between freedom and power. Man is free to adopt values and to choose his actions. But this does not at all mean that he may violate natural laws with impunity, that he may, for example, leap oceans at a single bound. In short, when we say that man is not free to leap the ocean, we are really discussing not his lack of freedom but his lack of power to cross the ocean given that the laws of his nature – given the laws of his nature and the nature of the world. And when I first read that, my reaction was that's not at all what the free will debate is. The free will debate is not about whether – Man can choose to do things that are physically impossible, and if the answer, you know, and if the answer seems to be yes, he can't choose those things, then there's no free will. But instead, whether his choosing is actually free or determined. So I think that I think that this is a confusion that he's created. I, I think he's only talking about political freedom here. I don't think it's a free will debate. The first sentence makes it makes it sound like that, like like Crusoe, as in the case of any man. Is on page thirty three, has freedom of will, freedom to choose the course of his life and his actions. So it sounds like he's talking about free free will in the more metaphysical, less political sense. But then I think when he's saying that you have freedom, um, you know, he's not free to leap the ocean. I think the rest of it is about political freedom. So he's not. I don't think he's misunderstanding the free will debate. I don't know, Jason Grant. Do you? Yeah, I think uh, lack of lack of political freedom in this case would be. That uh, the government patrols the uh, shoreline, and whenever yeah. anyone tries to leap across the ocean, they get shot. Uh, that would be that would be political. Uh, but he's he's talking about something that uh, has nothing to do with whether we internally have free will, whether uh, given the same initial set of circumstances, uh, we might have chosen differently. Yeah, uh, I, which is which is completely unrelated. Yeah, I, I think what's going on here is not that he thinks he needs to answer the determinists to for his system okay. to work. Uh, I think it's that he's misunderstanding, like that free will has a specific meaning in philosophy that is not the one he's using, right? Because if if we look later in, in terms of how he applies this free will issue, it's always in terms of. Uh, Attacking ideas of of uh, I guess, well capabilitarian right that that the when he when he thinks uh, free will he he seems to think that people uh, think you're not free because you can't do everything you could imagine right which is and he, and he wants to contrast that with freedom from restraint I I do think it it's an error that uh, inhibits comprehension definitely. Well, certainly. I mean a lot of people do like to try to conflate capacity and political liberty, which are different things. And uh, yeah, I love capacities. It's great that I have the ability to read or to play chess or whatever. Uh, but that's not – uh, that's not something that's a, a political question, at least thankfully in the United States. Uh, that's a question of individual human capacities, not about the arbitrary will of someone else uh, forbidding a game or forbidding a, a, you know consumption of literature. Does Rothbard need to say anything to the determinists? Uh, not for this book, I don't think. Um, unless unless it's ethically meaningful, like that. If you're a determinist, then it's hard to talk about ethics in certain ways, but uh, for most most of the time, political philosophy does not begin with a question of free will yeah, or the, determinism the only, or compatibilism or whatever. The only time I, I could think of it coming up is he he talks about the alienability of the will a lot, and that discussion sort of makes no sense if there's like no such thing as a a will independent of just physical processes in your brain. Yes. Okay, so at this point, what we've gotten to is we're still dealing with the single person. In this chapter, and how that single person comes to own things, and so the upshot is that a man owns himself, and he also owns anything that he transforms or produces. And so then, chapter seven, interpersonal relations, voluntary exchange, is when Rothbard starts introducing other people 
Friday. to this picture. Yeah. Um, and we, we start seeing how trade functions and the, the benefits of that. And again, this is one where he he's basically making the same sorts of economic thought experiments that we see all the time, that he's he's selling us on the benefits of exchange by saying, look at, you know, here's comparative advantage and here's how exchange makes both parties at least subjectively better off. Um, and then moves into a rather nice summary of the role of capitalists mm -hmm. in the society. Yeah, I, the, I think the reason he he's undertaking this this whole discussion actually is he feels he needs to answer answer the commies basically. Yeah, and and I think that he's. I mean, I flagged the there's like a two paragraph overview of the benefit that the capitalist brings to. A free society and why they're not Marxist villains that I think is actually pretty terrific. Um, oh yeah, he has his moments. That's absolutely true. Um, yeah. should, should I just uh, read that bit? Sure. Thus, the indispensable and enormously important function of Polk, the capitalist in our example of the market economy, is to save the laborers from the necessity of restricting their consumption and thus saving up the capital themselves and from waiting for their pay until the product would hopefully be sold at a profit further down the chain of production. Hence, the capitalist, far from somehow depriving the laborer of his rightful ownership of the product, makes possible a payment to the laborer considerably in advance of the sale of the product. Furthermore, the capitalist in his capacity as forecaster or entrepreneur saves the laborer from the risk that the product might not be sold at a profit or that he might even suffer losses. And if anything, that's uh, an understatement of what a, a capitalist does because uh, capital also increases the value of labor. It's uh, – uh, not simply that the laborer gets paid a little bit in advance or, or you know, several months in advance. It's that the laborer's work uh, per hour is worth more when it can manufacture goods that are uh, are produced using advanced or or capital intensive processes. I, I think it's important though to distinguish between like that's that's a function of the size of the capital stock. It's not a function of the private ownership of capital, That's true. which is what Rothbard is, I think, trying to defend here. So after the capitalist discussion, um, he gives a little overview of what ownership in a free market looks like. Um, and so I think this is again probably worth just reading really quickly because I mean one of the nice things about this book is Rothbard is very good at summarizing himself throughout, um, which I found refreshing and super helpful and something that a lot of other writers could learn from. And that is – I mean Rothbard is a remarkably clear writer. Um, he's a terrific communicator and I think explains a lot of his popularity. Um, so here he says, OK. So we talked about we've, – we've gone through and looked at how man acquires property, how he acquires ownership, what sorts of things he can own and then how that works with trade. And so he says, OK. All ownership on the free market reduces ultimately back to A, ownership by each man of his own person and his own labor, B, ownership by each man of land which he finds unused and transfers by his own labor, and C, the exchange of the products of this mixture of A and B with the similarly produced output of other persons on the market. And so that he then tells us, look, if we have a system that is – there's our concept of property, there's our concept of exchange and we respect all of those things, then that is what he calls the free society or the regime of pure liberty. And then he tells us, look, the rest of the book is just the implications of the regime of pure liberty. An important thing to note uh, while we're on this section is uh, on page 36 in my, my copy, uh, he's talking about exchange of goods and he says, apples are not simply being exchanged for butter or gold for horses, what is really being exchanged is not the commodities themselves but the rights to ownership of them. And that will come up later when he talks about his theory of contract. Well, yeah, the ownership thing is, I mean, Aaron said on these, these sort of whatever uh, three types of uh, market or mark, what is it? All ownership on the free market reduces ultimately back to those three types of ownership. I mean, it's it's interesting. Does it does it seem that he basically says like everything flows from this? And I'm sitting here reading about this, and since I'm predisposed to, you know, 
think along these lines about whether or not what other people would say about this who are not libertarians, uh, for example, about what 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 everything flows from is not ownership but something else uh, having to do with more questions of initial physical uh, allotment or things like this that that you can't reduce justice down to these basic questions. I mean and that's and, – and since Aaron sort of asked that he said like the whole book after this is just sort of a discussion of the implications of these like exchanges. When someone comes along and sort of denies the entire premise of what's going on like – and I don't mean like a specific philosopher. I mean uh, a pretty intelligent leftist, for example, or something like that. And they say, no, no, this is not – you began at the totally wrong spot here. You, you need to start with – and I was trying to think of what they would, what they would say, where, where they would start in terms of we need to, to talk about a just society. We need to start with a question of what do people deserve or something like this. And so they would refute the entire Crusoe, everything about this. They would say you can't build it this way. But how would they, how would they start it then? And thus refute the does, does the question make sense? And thus refute the simplicity well, I mean, that, that that he's saying here. We just put these pieces together, and then we build them off, and we say you have ownership. People can't take it. Then we do this, and we do this, and they say, well, no, that's not that simple. There are all sorts of ways that you could you could try to uh, to uh, throw a wrench into the system. You could, uh, for example, deny that labor is properly alienated. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're not allowed to work for someone else, or or that. Uh, Transfers of that type are illegitimate, yeah. and uh, that would uh, that would pretty well disrupt the whole thing. Uh, whether or not you know, whether or not you agreed with it, you might uh, you might deny that uh, the idea of mixing one's labor with uh, with property is legitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to me, frankly, it does sound pretty metaphysical, and uh, I like to justify property with reference to uh, with reference to uh, what uh, effects it has, rather than. With reference to uh, this uh, this mixture that I can't detect with an instrument, or that I I can't always necessarily even tell with common sense, has happened. I think. I mean, another way that I think you could you could try to undercut it is if if we're right that he has not adequately argued for length of life as the ultimate value, um, and the only thing that matters in judging the ethics of an action, then. Substituting something else in there, pre presenting a, another standard would lead to a totally different set of conclusions about the nature of property regimes and just transfers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean if you said – if you if you provided a cogent argument that instead of like the good thing to do is whatever prolongs your life but instead the good thing to do is whatever maximizes fairness. Yeah. Well, which that's I don't think it's true but you could you could certainly make an argument for it. Then that would lead to something that looked like a different sort of property rights regime than this one. Well, that's why I think it's interesting. So, like, this the reason I brought this up is so like he has a kind of finders keepers or you have to mix your land with your value, but the, you're the first one there, so you can do it, so you can homestead it. Now, the reason you might be the first one to come across it uh, has nothing to do with fairness or justice or anything like this whatsoever. It's I mean, on one level, finders keepers is a a conflict avoidance principle. I mean, right? Like, it's it actually has very little. It, it's not saying that you really deserve this or this is like yours for a good reason. It's that like if you're holding on to it and someone actually wants to take it from you, then physical violence is going to result, and so we're going to have finders keepers as just yeah. A, when a uh, when Hoppe talks about this idea of first comers and later comers and who should be privileged with regards to property rights, he he really plays up that angle. Yeah, that like he says, look, like. When it comes to unowned things becoming owned, your options are, you know, first come, first served, or like we have this massive problem where like you you have to like consider the interests of like all these other people who may not even be born yet, and it's just it's it's not not only impractical but impracticable. Like mm -hmm. it's 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 not it's not an option that's that's on the table for how to in, to actually organize a functioning human society. Well, that's why I think that, like, moving on to uh, um, the next part, which I would uh, on uh, chapter chapter eight, eight uh, where we talk about the meaning of ownership, and and kind of coming back to my question previously, that um, uh, let's see, 
Where, is it? Where do I have? I have it here written down. Ah, here we go. Um, if each man is not entitled to full and 100 percent self-ownership, then what does this imply? It implies either one of two conditions. One, the communist one of universal and equal other ownership or two, partial ownership of one group by another, a system of rule by one class over another. Now, this is kind of interesting because this is weirdly consequentialist. I mean, in the sense of like these are both obviously stupid, so they can't be right. It's kind of I mean, there's these kind of implication here, which I'm you know, other people are like, no, you're right. That like uh, it has to be number two. People have partial ownership of a group by another, and the point of the political system is to figure out how to negotiate that problem. So I'm just going to like resist this. I mean, it's like he's trying to do a reductio, and a lot of people would be like, I'm, I don't think it's a reductio at all. The point of the political process is to have people negotiate commonly owned property, including your natural endowments. For well, example. I mean, I hope it's not uh, too pedantic to point out that Rothbard was an anarchist and he really did think that the political process was an instance of one class exerting control over another class. No, it's not pedantic at all. It's a, it's a great observation. So is – yeah, is the – we have one and two, which people could just accept, communist, everyone owns everyone else, which is always just seen as self-refuting by people, which I think is – libertarians are a little bit too – so I, I just sort of say – I flip it about saying, well, that's obviously not true because some people actually believe that or partial ownership of one group by another. And so I mean, yes, politics according to Rothbard is like that. But but I think that this – the reason I think this – the reason I brought this up and highlighted it is something Aaron has written about, for example, that you don't own that is like partially – is related to this in some way. The kind of Elizabeth Warren, you don't own that. Uh, part argument is is taking a, a sort of a the, you didn't build be, that you mean yeah you sorry you did build that yes yeah uh, so this is this is to some extent a another possible objection to his property rights regime is the the argument that Elizabeth Warren has made but lots of other people have as well that look you come into the world into a world that has already in basically every way been improved by others um, that. Everything that you do, all the benefits that you have are the result of the improvements made by others and if you're taking the standard progressive version of this, what they mean is improvements made by government. So they established the legal system and built the roads and provided your schooling and all of that and so you are – because everyone has improved this stuff, so everyone therefore has a partial ownership in it, everything that you have is partially owned by everyone else and at least to an extent that what that means is that you now need to pay taxes or obey the law or do something to discharge that, that debt. Yes, but uh, you can easily deny that. Robert Nozick very clearly does so, uh, so saying that uh, – I believe the example he used was if, if your window is open and someone throws a book into your window, uh, they don't then get the right to demand payment for that. If you, if you haven't asked for it, even if you decide to keep it, it doesn't create an obligation in you. Possibly. But I, I, the reason I wanted to get to that, um, that question is because you know, in the question I was saying, well, what would left-wingers think about this is that this – Crusoe example is actually completely unhelpful for that reason. Like it doesn't actually give us almost anything about how a person should behave in this world because you you don't walk into a world with no – on a desert island with no previously existing structures or anything that you don't like owe people for. Now Jason's point well taken. Like um, maybe you don't owe everyone but you might owe some group or some subset of people or some group we call the government because they gave you roads and a school and traffic lights and the drug war. Well, maybe not the drug war but things like that. Um, and so you owe them for this reason. I, I think that that is the prevailing ethic of you know, not even you know just leftists. But even a very strong subset of conservatives, I think it's a pretty, pretty uh, challenging objection to this sort of simplistic system. Well, I mean, I think I think Grant, you're looking at me like I'm crazy. Well, I, I I disagree strongly that it's a good objection to Rothbard's system. <laughs> I said cogent. I mean, I, mean, oh, I, don't, mean okay. I don't mean I'm convinced by it. I'm going to quit my job yeah. and go go I mean, work at Center for American Progress. Yeah, I, I think like, like well, the reason all of us are in this room and not you know somewhere down the street. We're not doing a Rothbard episode at the Center for American yeah. Progress. <laughs> yes, that, <laughs> is that is that yeah? We we think that these are silly arguments for yes. for, for, for reasons Jason, uh, Jason's. Uh, point someone gives you a gift yeah. that you are actually incapable of refusing. 
then your yeah. acceptance of that gift does not create an obligation. Well, and it's, it and could it's not also, have been otherwise. And it's also completely ahistorical in terms of like where states actually come from, right? Which is I think uh, – and, and here's – actually just below this, uh, Rothbard starts pointing out that it's – in, in some ways, you know, this idea of other uh, us having these kind of like obligations just by virtue of existing, it's it's only compatible with some kind of weird aristocracy, right? Where he says, uh, let's consider alternative two that one person or group of persons G are entitled uh, to own not only themselves but also the remainder of society R. Right? But apart from the many other problems and difficulties with this, this kind of system, we cannot have a universal or natural law ethic for the human race. We can only have a partial and arbitrary ethic similar to the view that Hohenzollerns are by nature entitled to rule over non-Hohenzollerns. So I noted this because this is a big part of his argument is that his system, this, this regime of pure liberty is universalizable in a way that pretty much everything else would not be and that – an ethics, a system of ethics, you must be able to universalize it in order for it to be legitimate. But my my question there is because he doesn't really offer a, an argument for it's he he basically asserts that. Well, I think he thinks it's obvious, right? And yeah. so my question is it is it obvious? Because is there a way outside of saying that we have a system where everyone has these certain kinds of rights and self ownership to say like what is what is on its face wrong with? say, a system that says, look, I've got a universal ethic and what it says is everyone must follow these rules unless you have red hair, in which case you have to follow these rules and that's – I mean that's completely universal. Like it applies to everyone. It's just that what you do is different based on whether you have red hair or not. You're just discriminating against me, Aaron. I know you've always wanted to put redheads in a corner. I know. I think they're there's that category of unprotected classes under the Constitution, and I would put redheads in there. But you know, like, there, what is on its face wrong with that sort of system? Besides that, it seems to clash with our libertarian intuitions. Well, it also, it also, in a sense, clashes with intuitions that are widely shared on the left that there ought to be legal equality. That legal equality is, in some sense, important. Well, the uh, funny thing is, is that. I mean, Aaron asked a really good question, uh, and everything I am now going to say should, should be just constructed, construed as, as uh, in, you know, indulging into this question of like, if you wanted to say, because I've I been writing, reading a lot about eugenics, for example, and or any sort of racism, and say that there are inherent differences between people. There's actually no reason that people should have equal justice around them because there are stupid people or there are different races or whatever classification you want to say. But I mean you could say that we already do that. We actually give legal disabilities to people of a certain you – know, under a certain IQ or a, of a certain ability. So we don't – Certain ages. There's certain ages. So we, 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 we have a system for functioning adults. But if you wanted to endorse – maybe I mean like, like, like Jason said, you're going against liberalism. In the in the oldest, biggest sense of the word, the thing that we all are in this town, mostly or at least pretend to be, you show you're going against the basic equality of man. But there is nothing about this that is obviously that any political system has to endorse a basic equality. Right. Like, of man. Have, have you seen the Hohenzollerns? I, I mean, mean, like, yeah, no, they're 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 the they're the hypochondriac. To ask hypochondriac, this the, in a way uh, that the, uh, bleeders the. Um, is, is it the hemophiliacs? Whole? Hemophiliacs. No, nah, those are those are the children and grandchildren of, of the Habsburgs. Queen Victoria. The Habsburgs. Queen Victoria, in fact, <laughs> okay, she, she was the origin. Yeah. I, I just, I just want to in, interrupt for for a minute uh, and say that uh, I think, in some sense, this is Rothbard at his best. What he's sort of trying to do here, where like, yeah, he's probably wrong that he's like logically exhausted the the possible ways of arranging, you know, different people's ownership of other people or not. But what he has done is he's taken that liberal tradition that goes back to Locke and that that idea that in the state of nature, you know, everyone has like reciprocal only reciprocal authority over anyone else, and right, and you have this bubble of rights, and he shows, you know, I think compellingly that what that implies is that when we endow the actors of the state with special privileges, basically what we've done is said like you have to throw the Enlightenment out the window. 
to if you want to get there. No, that's a really good point. It's like I'm going to reductio. If you can either be a liberal or a complete class based person who endorses monarchy. And I, I I do I do more or less agree with that. Uh, at, at least among the choices presented, uh, one is very obviously preferable, and that's that's the the liberal alternative. But there are a lot of choices that aren't presented. Uh, you could be a non-cognitivist about self-ownership. You could just say, look, uh, ownership is not a thing that appertains to people just like it doesn't appertain to numbers. You can't own five. Right. You, know, yeah. you can't own, you can't own uh, the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, and there's a footnote here where uh, apparently he did get someone to read the manuscript because it says uh, Professor George Mavrodes of the Department of Philosophy of uh, the University of Michigan, go Wolverines. Uh, says also you could it could just be the fact that nobody owns anyone you know themselves or anyone else right and then uh, then Rothbard answers kind of infuriatingly uh, since ownership signifies range of control this would mean that no one would be able to do anything and the human race would quickly vanish and I uh, before before we we sat down I, I sort of dug into this a little bit. And uh, here, here's how uh, David Gordon uh, writes about this. He says, quote, uh, in the way Rothbard is using the term hu human beings must be owned, unquote. And then there's a footnote that says this usage of ownership is quite common among the Austrian school of economics, see Mises socialism. And then Mises says – we're kind of a little deep down the rabbit hole here. But Mises says, regarded as a sociological category, ownership appears as the power to use economic goods. An owner is he who disposes of an economic good. Thus, the sociological and juristic concepts of ownership are different. And then a little farther down, the significance of the legal, legal concept of property lies just in this, that it differentiates between the physical has and the legal should have. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of trouble with this though because yes, it's true that ownership signifies a range of control but lots of other things signify a range of control as well. I could rent a car and then I control it but I don't own it. We have some, uh, I could, we have some temper, a type of possessory right in it. You know, somewhat, somewhat more horribly, I could take people as slaves and then I have control over them. Uh, am I the rightful owner of them? No, of course not. Uh, you, well, I, I like this point. So, so that's interesting that this is a new thing that I hadn't really thought of with Grant reading that, that you could just say, no, you're wrong. Like ownership – like so no one owns anyone. Like I'm going to redefine you know, hypothetical philosopher A. I'm going to redefine ownership as a term that means not just that you have control, which is kind of interesting because then like maybe people with Tourette's don't own themselves or something like this. Well, I have but allergies not, and you know that means I yeah. don't fully control myself either. I mean there's there's an enormous problem here. Yeah, really not, not just that you have control, but there's a that there's a moral uh, right or some sort of component to the fact that you you own yourself. And so maybe you could just you could actually coherently disavow owning yourself by redefining what ownership is as a moral right to do with what you want. And since you don't have that, then the ownership resides in something else, like maybe collectively or with the state. But I'm saying that's a different – like ownership is not control. And if, if, and if he's going to sort of stick to control, um, then that's one way of – Well, the problem is he it. doesn't, right? It is going all the way back to like chapter 6 even and up through this point, he, he, he seems to be tacitly and sometimes even explicitly equivocating between – like just control as in like property, right? And just control simpliciter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, you know, I'm I'm not the first person to make this observation, but I think it's it's important that we bring it up that sometimes like you can read something Rothbard says and it's a, and you think to yourself, okay, that can't possibly be right, but if you, if you just read him as meaning ownership is just control, then it makes sense, right? But it, then oftentimes it doesn't actually get him where he wants to go. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a Venn diagram, and and the big the big circle is is control, and the somewhat smaller circle that only partially overlaps with that is ownership. There are times when I have both ownership and control, and there are times when I just have control, and there are times when I just have ownership without control. Uh, it's it's only in a very very limited sense that I control the shares of stock that I own. I can sell them. I can give them. Uh, I can uh, bequeath them when I die, but you know, how much do I actually control the company? I can vote, you know, when a shareholder vote comes up, but that's you know not a whole lot of control. So at this point, then Rothbard makes an argument that he pulls from and cites Oppenheimer that there are really only two ways for someone to acquire the wealth and resources they need to live: that they can they can produce it themselves, um, or they can 
coercively expropriate it from others and this is where he makes another version of his universal ethic argument because what he says is that because we need to produce in order to live, we come into a world that's not set up for us to just live without producing anything, that parasitism is not a universal ethic. If everyone was a parasite, we'd all die um, and and so we need to all produce and that that's the ethical thing to do. Well, so there's two things to say about this. I think the first is is like it's it's just obviously false that any behavior which isn't universalizable is wrong, right? Like the fact that if I flooded the earth, we would all die doesn't mean that irrigating some croplands is wrong. The fact that you know everybody shouldn't become a barber doesn't mean that being a barber is wrong. Well, yeah, and this is this is really a uh, it's a bastardization of Kant. You know, Kant did not say that everyone has to be some sort of a universal man and do a little bit of everything. Uh, what he was saying is that a a maxim behind someone's action ought to be universalizable. It ought to be something you could will that everyone desired likewise. And that's not uh, everybody needs to be a barber. That would be something much more like everyone needs to make an honest living. Or, uh, or have the ability to make a choice to be things of which one of them could be a barber. And it's, it's more universalizable than, uh, than in that. But like I mean – and the universalizability are just the basic ownership and Voluntary exchange and self-ethic of the whole thing, so so it's it's a little bit different. Than but that, I, yeah. I think Rothbard survives here because I could will that everyone made an honest living. I could not will that everyone would be a parasite. But his criteria isn't could we will this? It's going back to his prolonging of life basis for ethics, which is that in order to prolong your life, you need to produce. And so therefore, being a parasite, you can't goes against this life prolonging thing. Which it seems, if I'm understanding correctly, it seems just not true. I mean, well, not in the for sense the that like we can, we can first off, there's historically lots and lots of examples of people who lived extremely long lives off the backs of others, um, and and secondly, we can possibly imagine you can see this in the animal kingdom equilibriums that settle in perfectly well with. As long as a certain percent of people don't cheat, then a certain percent can get away with it and everything's hunky dory. Um, so it's not it's not clear why, according to this life as the standard of value ethic, we must get to production only and not parasites. Oh, I, I fully agree. Uh, if if that's the uh, basis of the of the ethics here, uh, there's a problem. Uh, if you are going to take the universalizability criterion. As your your standard of value, first of all, uh, you have to look at maxims. You have to be you have to be more properly Kantian, and then and then you can't say prolonging life is the standard of value. Rather, you would have to say something like having a good and consistent and rational will is the standard of value. And can you will something consistently and rationally? And if you can't do that, then you have to give up on it as a maxim. But that's a different ethical system entirely. Yeah, I mean, I think that the distinction he makes between parasitism and production and exchange is is a good one, and I think also that it's true that we like production and exchange, and we don't like parasitism in whatever forms it may take. Um, Unless you're a parasite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but we're not. Yes, well, yeah. no. Here's the thing, though. Even even parasites, one imagine, don't like other parasites, right? It's one of those. Like, I'm sure Aaron has a great example of a Greek person who said that. Uh, that the case is that you know justice is just whatever is good for me, right? Yeah. Well, but, that's uh, I mean that that's the the Oppenheimer thing here is. Yeah. I mean Oppenheimer is very explicit about it, and again, like Rothbard is getting at something interesting. What he needs more is a better theory of universalizability about why, and which basically is the, is like, and I think Grant's observation that. Like he's sort of saying either ditch liberalism, like he's like pushing back against the, the you know either ditch the enlightenment or get on board with me. But if he were going to start even at a further degree, he's like this is why any political system has to be uni universalizable within these constraints. I don't I think he missed that step. And if he could hit that step, it's like this is why people can't rule over other people, even if they are smarter and Hohen's I, I think what he's trying to do, like less than he's like assuming that you think that being a parasite is bad. 
being Ho- Hohenzollern is bad, right? And I think what he's what he's trying to do is like he's drawing this line and showing that this this thing that many people defend is actually on the bad side of the line. Yes. So we ran this risk when we started and it looks like it's come to pass that we have all overestimated our focus and brevity uh, and have <laughs> – I never overestimate my brevity. <laughs> run into our our episode length limit while only making it through chapter 8 instead of the planned chapter 13. So with that in mind, I think we will have to add another Rothbard episode to our plan which will come – I assure you, much quicker on the heels of this one than this one came on the one before it. Um, so, tune in. Smash the state. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just dismantle it carefully so nobody gets hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.